Hi everyone, it's Grant Adams speaking and these are my top five SMSF and estate planning strategies for 2020. In fact, there's probably about 15 of them, but uh, I've really just said top five um, and we're gonna go pretty fast paced. Uh, can you believe it's actually 2020 already? Um, this is my second webinar for the year. Uh, for those of you who are I Love SMSF members um, or LY strategists, um, I've sent out the content calendar, which you can actually see on our events on uh, ilovesmsf.com and I think I've got probably around about maybe 15 hours uh, of uh, webinars between now and 30 June covering the whole gamut from ethics to um, obviously the Corporations Act, um, the, the client care, all those non-technical ones that you need. And I've also got a two-day workshop uh, on the 23rd and 24th of March up here in beautiful uh, Twin Waters and um, that'll be available. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then I've got a roadshow around Australia in May. So you're easily going to make sure you get your full CPD requirements from me. Um, obviously, at a highly specialised level, as you would expect. Um, now, I was, when I was doing this today, I was going back and remembering in my boyhood um, the concept of 2020. I think it's actually a bit more than uh, 2000. 2000 was sort of still really close to you know, the, the 20th century and 2020, we're right smack into the 21st century. And I was thinking about, you know, my boyhood, thinking about driverless cars. Remember the old Jetsons, um, the Dick Tracy watch, we were uh, talking to our watches. Remember those guys who were, who were old enough, you'd have mumbles and all those sort of guys, um, be able to travel out of space. And of course, like the Jetsons, there'd be lots and lots of robots doing all of our work. And there's no flying cars, obviously, but Look, if you have a look at the drones these days, so uh, they're quite phenomenal. In fact, they have made um, human um, human passenger drones. Uh, so it's uh, it's an interesting scenario where we were. So we're probably my boyhood. We're probably right there now about the the, the future. And look, it's it's absolutely amazing. I certainly would say that uh, the, I wouldn't say the phones, the smart devices that we have these days, the connection through the internet, and compared to where we're going to go with five G over the next 10 years is going to be absolutely phenomenal. And certainly I'm very excited about it. And look, I, I can't wait to get to 2030 and, and look back on this decade and, and see what achievements there have been. For me, I, I can see it because obviously you, you'll see, not, not so much today, but for those of you who've been following me, um, that the, the, the whole of the accounting planning and particularly the legal industries are all um, getting disrupted. Um, it's very confronting, I think, if you've got a, a old school mentality. Uh, particularly, I feel sorry for the financial planning profession um, in that, uh, look, there's some good eggs, bad eggs, there's everything. And um, look, uh, after that Royal Commission um, and with FASIA, there's just so much going on. And really, people are, are starting to retire or leave the industry, which generally I think is probably too soon um look i after i sold out of now infinity i had a couple of years off i wrote the um obviously the guru's guide to self-managed super funds started up i love smsf uh, but i can tell you i don't know because i'm still a young person and young at heart young at mind um, that i really need to be doing stuff all the time in fact i didn't have a break over uh, the holiday i think even i worked christmas morning uh, getting emails out and that's Look, I've, I've had those breaks and I can tell you, um, coming back into it and um, looking at the year ahead, I'm like so passionate, so excited. There's so many great things going on and so many opportunities because when one, uh, a lot of people leave the industry, that leaves a lot of uh, clients potentially um, orphans or, or without homes, which then gives opportunities because you can pick them up for nothing um, or at very low rates. Alternatively, can buy them off accountants or planners um, on a um, on effectively a, a vendor financing, and you'll find that you'll you'll end up making quite a uh, you'll make the money back within three or four months. So, it's look, it's a pretty exciting um, area. You'll see that uh, my my um, domain is expanding. Um, I can see at the moment the SMSF industry is uh, maturing. Continually, as we go down the track, it's going to get harder and harder. When ASIC comes out and says that you need at least $500,000 and 100 hours, um, you could, and, and they're sending that to existing SMSF members, you know, there's a huge full court press from ASIC, um, from the ATO in terms of compliance. 
um, and also obviously from industry funds, uh, as for everyone against the SMSF industry. So uh, continually as we go down the track, there'll be greater clearings of call for us to pay our fair share, so on and so forth. So look, for me, um, I, I see the, the, smart, the compliance side is, is obviously under a continual fee pressure. I know that there's uh, quite a few outsourcers who are doing uh, full uh, audits and also SMSFs uh, accounts for $695. Uh, which is to me is is quite uh, is quite un unbelievable. So good on them if they can do that effectively. Uh, but the advice side, you know, I see switching to JVs, partnerships, uh, living wills, SMSF estate planning, and around the big one is family protection. And um, I'm starting to segue myself into uh, you'll see a little bit later on into uh, succession and also estate planning. The reason I'm doing that is SMSFs are a mature market and uh, I've, I've had a look at all the statistics and from what I've seen is that uh, there is essentially $300 billion which will transfer hands from SMSFs in one way, shape or form over the next 20 years. Uh, but if I then take that to the broader community through family trusts, um, generally through ordinary estates such as investment properties, etc., it's actually going to be $3 trillion. So, being ever the uh, ever the optimist, I'd rather go for the three trillion than the three hundred billion. Now, if I go for the three trillion, the three hundred billion is caught up anyway. And I can see that at my age, that the, the big growth area is for that uh, family protection, family wealth protection uh, for people, you know, virtually of any age. But certainly, uh, as we go down the track, the, the people with quite a significant amount of wealth um, over age sixty. So that's, uh, that's uh, one area that I want to work in. And for those of you who've got businesses, we've got like so much stuff coming out. Look, it, it just blows my mind. It's really exciting. Now, I thought I'd just put in a bit of goss, a bit of news before we get into the strategies. I won't spend much time on that. But for those of you who saw the controversial research paper, I think the SMSFA um, uh, smashed it. And really, the look, I'll leave it up to them, but I, I've never seen anyone at all, particularly if they've got an advisor, spend 100 hours a year on an SMSF. Um, I had a couple of SMSFs with uh, around about six, seven hundred thousand dollars in them. I'd be lucky, honestly. Um, I'm a hold and you know set and forget sort of guy. I had golden ETFs and really probably with my advisors, I would have spent maybe maybe three hours a year on it, maybe an hour looking through the audit. I mean, there wasn't that much work to do. There's only a couple of investments in cash. So you know, from that perspective, it's um, look the ASIC one is. It's just a, a way of um, really pushing against um, SMSFs. There's obviously great concern that um, people are pulling money out of retail industry super funds, setting up SMSFs, and then accessing their superannuation, which I've seen a couple of people uh, just recently. And obviously, the tax office is pretty big against that. In fact, they're now uh, slow, slow, slow walking um, any ABNs and TFNs. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are doing really well, but a couple of uh, our advisors, you know, it's been waiting for 28 days for them. Obviously, there's been Christmas, but, you know, they're doing that. They're calling the clients. So it's a it's a really big um, switch around SMSFs. Um, the six-member fund um, obviously is on ice at the moment, uh, but expected to be introduced. So it was originally um, prior to the election was tied up in a bill with the uh, beer excise uh, reduction um, that now has uh, they've been split apart. So the, the legislation is there, but I, I would dare say that it's going to be reintroduced sometime this year. So eyes open for that one. Uh, as I said, wholesalers fees are coming down um, all the time. Um, with the accounts and the licensing issue, as far as I'm concerned, I've seen uh, what SMSFA have done. CPA and also the Institute of Chartered Accountants. And they're all um, seem to be coming up with a de facto licensing regime that they look after, which that'd be the last thing that I, I think any of us need is um, having some arbitrary awards. You know, from my perspective is we should really be going on the front foot and arguing that an SMSF is really, and look, I, I know my trust from both sides, an SMSF is really no different from a discretionary trust. There are, obviously, it's better from a tax concession point of view, but like beneficiaries, there's members. Like a trustee, there's a trustee. So, you know, from that perspective, I would argue that as long as there's no investments involved, and that would include investment strategies, that um, SMSF should be treated 
are just the same as family trusts and should be excluded altogether from the Corporations Act. When you actually find how they were included in the first instance, it's a very obtuse and links through to the CIS Act, Section 10.1. And really, from that perspective, I, I think the argument should be, let's get rid of the whole thing, which would then open the pot to everyone, uh, because then it's not just accountants. Um, anyone could, you know, there's going to be limits on who can advise. But again, it's not technical advice. It should be left to accountants, financial planners, so on and so forth. So uh, the, the way they're pushing it, I don't look. I just don't agree with it. I think we should actually go in and, and push it really hard. Uh, maybe none of you may have seen this. Uh, I had um, uh, Daniel from uh, from BGL uh, sent me a link from LinkedIn that Matthew Burgess from View Legal uh, is now uh, out and about and they're doing their own thing. Uh, this was, uh, you can go and just check Matthew Burgess, View Legal on his LinkedIn post and they're broken away from now Infinity, which is Mike's firm. So. I'm not sure for those of you who are with Now Infinity, um, you might want to get back to them and um, ask them what's happening in terms of their legal documentation and uh, legal sign-off. I, I certainly know from um, our perspective at Lightyear Docs, uh, we've got Abbott and Morley. That's not going to happen with us because we own the uh, legal firm. Uh, but more importantly, just today, we've picked up a couple of Now Infinity uh, former clients and 10 uh, during December. So. If you're now infinity, just go and check out with them or tell them if you want to come to me and have a chat, I'm more than happy to look after you. Um, and down the bottom one, just be really careful about the non-technical CPD. We've had a couple of uh, requests for CPD uh, recently. We've got a whole range of CPD um, in our, um, uh, in our uh, I Love SMSF. But go and have a look at Lightyear because you can actually combine the documentation with the CPD as well. Uh, as I would expect, um, by May and June, there'll be a lot of people um, out and about looking for not so much the technical CPD, uh, but more importantly, the nine hours of, of ethics. If you've done the ethics exam, you're okay. Uh, but then you've got the five hours of client care and the five hours of corporate regulations. Now, um, I've uh, created our CPD program uh, to make sure um, that effectively uh, it's catered for that um, so that there's plenty of hours there before. And as I said, if you take into account the uh, roadshow coming up in uh, May, um, or if you come on our two day retreat, you've virtually got, um, you're going to have a full book. So for those of you who do need um, CPD, just be really careful um, that you are, are getting those other hours uh, rather than the technical. So that's just a bit of news. Um, let's go in and have a bit of a reality check around SMSFs and superannuation. Uh, look, these are, I, look, I'm happy to debate with you, but um, I think all of us, uh, a lot of our clients just don't trust superannuation with ongoing changes and complexity. Uh, I know here I've got the new 2020 book on order, but the last one I've got is 2,800 pages. And, and even for an experienced lawyer, um, it's, it's a lot to, to behold. Um, and it's generally why most estate planning lawyers will flip um, superannuation into an estate, um, mainly because they don't want to get involved in, in um, SMSF law. In fact, we've created, uh, and again, I, I haven't got time to talk about it now, but we've created an SMSF Death Benefits Trust, which comes out of an SMSF will. It doesn't go through the estate. It's actually created um, out of the uh, superannuation fund and had a really senior lawyer who just didn't understand how that could happen. Uh, but then again, I mean, if you don't understand, you don't understand. But you know, we've got legal sign-off on it. Uh, we know the, the purpose. And if I showed it to you, you'd actually understand pretty easily what to do. But uh, generally, from most of our clients, they don't trust superannuation. Um, and I, I would also, look, I'm not bagging SMSFs at all, but if you think about all those poor people who had set up large pension accounts uh, going back um, in the you know, early 2000s uh, up to 2016, uh, that effectively by 2017, if their pension account was over 1.6 mil, they had to roll it back to the accumulation account or take it out. In fact, my look, my, my assessment is they should have. Most people should have taken it out and put it into a leading member discretionary trust. There, having a, an accumulation account retirement is just not good enough for estate planning purposes. But that's subject of another discussion. But again, it shows you that was quite a significant tax change. An amelioration, obviously, of a lot of imputation credits because if they go back to the 
um, accumulation side, then you're losing half the value of the imputation credits. And look, um, it also means that if you've got assets that are on the pension side, suddenly their capital gains are, are being brought back in. So to me, it was a fundamental change. Not many people complained about it, but you know, I was up in arms. But you know, if the clients don't complain, then um, they're just going to have to wear it. But again, that's retrospective legislation. It's something that we're all obviously, it's hard for us to argue to say to the client, well, there's never going to be any changes because we know that if you have all the budget papers that SMSFs are negative, that is, they, there's more in franking credit to pay down to SMSFs than there is actually tax taken in. So that is not justifiable in the long term. It's okay for the, the people who are uh, obviously uh, over 60 now, but remember, we've got the next generations coming through and they're not going to be as gracious um, as the current crop of politicians. In fact, look at Morrison's the one who introduced the T-bar in the first place. So we've just got to be really careful about that one. Uh, preservation rules are another stymie. Um, I mean, it's very hard to explain to, look, if SGC goes in for a 35, 40-year-old, 28-year-old, that's that's fine. But for them, the salary sacrifice up to $25,000 when they know they can't touch the money for a long time, it's stuck in there. Um, and then the rules can change. It's a pretty big ask. I mean, obviously, you guys would be great salespeople if you can effectively get around uh, that. And look, I, I see the, you know, you see the industry funds are likewise saying, well, you need to have at least a million dollars or plus in order to uh, retire successfully. And you can go on do your calculator, see what you'd be with your SGC. And then obviously their encouragement is to uh, salary sacrifice, increase your concessional or your non-concessional. Uh, but again, the preservation rules, um, which are going up to uh, age uh, 65, and I think um, even looking up to uh, age 70 for the age pension rules, they're gonna change uh, all the time. Uh, the tax office too um, is obviously having a significant impact. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, I'm finding uh, the tax office are getting super aggressive at the moment in terms of you know treating everyone as guilty uh, rather than innocent. Uh, their first foray this year, which we've gone over uh, time and time again um, in terms of their uh, mail out of 17,700 letters uh, to SMSFs that had effectively LRBAs, has impacted a lot of people. And of course, it's going to have an impact on auditors. I saw a, a good, um, in fact, a, a request from Michael Samu, who's one of our uh, LY strategist members uh, who sent through the new audit guidelines from the Commission of Taxation in terms of private companies and units and what's required in terms of valuation, which is, is obviously quite serious. Uh, to me, I think just having a brief look, it seems to me that we want to be doing a sale of, of private units or shares at some point in time uh, during the year, so at least we've got some sort of valuation. Otherwise, the last thing you want is in order to have to go through deep dive into a private uh, company or a unit trust and find out where things should be, particularly if it's a 1322C trust. Now, that investment strategy, I think a lot of people are getting, uh, look, I, I, we put our um, uh, hands up and started to move on it. And if you have a look at our investment strategy, we have a deed of rectification, ratification in it, which really um, says because if you're doing an investment strategy now for uh, a year ending 30 June 2019, you're around about 18 months too late. It should have been done in July 2018. But if you put in a deed of rectification ratification, then effectively you're covering yourself from that perspective. And that's really important because investment strategy is part of the governing rules of the fund um, and effectively enables the members to sue anyone who's involved in that process. Uh, you'll find with our investment strategy, it covers pensions. It's a whole lot of stuff if you've got um, more than 50% property investment, but it's pretty sophisticated. And it's only like $49 uh, per investment strategy. So I just think if you're getting around doing that now, and there's obviously going to be 600,000 funds doing it, um, the auditors are going to increase uh, their look at and their review of these investment strategies. But more importantly, just from our own perspective, we should be getting our clients um, to sign off or help or get us to help them do those investment strategies. And, and really, if it was me, I'd be doing uh, the 30 June 2019 and 30 June 2020 at the same time. Um, the low concessional contributions caps, I saw uh, the SMSFA uh, had a, um, a budget submission, which was great to take it up to 35, but really, 
you know, from my perspective, should go back up to 50. You know, once you're over age 50, people don't really have a huge amount in superannuation. They're too busy, really, uh, looking after private you know, kids' school fees. Private school fees. I've got my daughter through her last year at the moment. It's costing me 40 grand, and this is at St Leonard's in Melbourne. So that's a huge hike. So if you've got three or four kids at school, it's a lot. And then you've got mortgage pressures as well. In Australia, although we've got low rates at the moment, certainly nothing compared to Europe and uh, obviously the US, uh, but our rates are low. Can you imagine if our interest rates were twice as high? Uh, what a disaster it would be. At least our, and then the last thing, then our housing values would collapse as well. So a $25,000 concessional cap is, is just not good enough. And um, But again, you know, for most of us, we'd say to our clients, look, don't go above the 25. Um, and I just wanted to show you this little one. Um, now, this is the biggest bit of BS I've ever seen. So have a look at that. I'll just let you, I'm going to have a wee drink. Have a, have a read of it and tell me what you think, if you can see it. How is it possible one, for an industry fund to actually call their superannuation self-managed. It seems to me that they are actually treading on the toes of self-managed superannuation funds. So yeah, rather, I know they've got a self-managed option and you can see there what they've got. They've got you know, 300 shares, 21 ETFs, um, obviously uh, exclusive managed investments, which obviously be done by who? CBUS itself. Um, and then notice it's, it's not available for income stream accounts. So if we have a look at that, you know, they're getting more aggressive. Um, I actually did a talk uh, late last year uh, for Sebastian Mazza up in uh, Brisbane, and we had uh, one client there who had um, some friends who had more than a million dollars in various industry funds, and they seriously doubted why they should be in a self-managed super fund because their returns um, were so high. And of course, uh, if you've got a million dollars in industry fund, you have a look at it. Uh, I know one of our other um, uh, advisors in, um, in, in Melbourne, uh, Gordon Black from Wellshore, he had a look at it and effectively um, that uh, the, the amount of fees paid was up around about ten to $12,000 depending on the industry fund. So SMSFs are hugely cost effective uh, when you get to that amount of money. But again, um, expect them to come out more and more and say, well, why would you be in the self-managed super fund when you need to? They'll parrot, you know, obviously, um, I see you need to have $500,000. Of course, they'll say $500,000 per member and you need to spend 100 hours a year on work. Why not let us do it? Uh, we're very cheap and cheerful. Except, guess what? Once you start to put in the CBUS managed investments, the underlying managed investments, which are one half or 2%, things get extremely expensive. Um, let's have a look through some strategies and tips and uh, traps on uh, that one. And uh, I've got an anonymous attendee. Isn't this just more of union funds trying to destroy SMSFs that are only for the tour? Absolutely. So, uh, as, look, if you have a look at me, everything is getting the, we're getting external, we're getting external hurdles through the licensing regime, through um, SOAs, uh, through ACID coming out and, and pushing its barrow from ASFA. Uh, from now the tax office making it a lot harder uh, through that, it seems to be greater and greater high bar in terms of, uh, of SMSFs. But at the end of the day, you know, they're still a, a great vehicle, but they are limited. So my, my way of doing it, and I'll show it a little bit later, I, I like to run uh, an SMSF um, alongside a discretionary trust. I um, also like to put in some also structures. So really my thematic, um, and particularly those who are following me, is that uh, when a client dies, there is nothing in their estate. Um, everything is sitting in discretionary trusts or SMSFs. And you can do that um, with assets outside with no CGT um, or stamp duty. So we're building a product on that we call the protector. Um, and the reason we do that, obviously, if you get caught up in a Family Provisions Act and we just see them at Abbott Morley time and time again, that's at least three or four years and probably thousands of dollars. There was a really good um, case, the Miller versus Taylor case in Western Australia back in 2018. It was a, uh, a client or a, a, a person had died um, and then effective Andre Taylor died. Um, he had uh, a will that went to his two kids 
uh, his uh, spouse at that time or de facto was left out. So obviously a family provisions um, claim was made in Western Australia. Uh, from that, um, the court ended up awarding her $220,000. The rest was to go to the kids. The problem is by the time they got to the Supreme Court five years later, there was only $100,000 of the estate. Out of $600,000, there were legal fees. Up to that point in time, that was only um, fees paid and WIP, um, which effectively, that was at uh, $500,000. So by the time everything wrapped up, it would have been up around about five fifty. So again, we don't want to get involved at all in the Family Provisions Act, which is what well, my my goal is for you and your clients how to how to achieve that using a, a whole range of tools. Um, now, all of the strategies we're going to is going to be found in law cases or commissioner guidelines. I love the ATO guidelines uh, or determination of rulings because they provide you with a strong foundation. Uh, there's a great ruling uh, dealing uh, with uh, salary sacrifice uh, whereby a spouse um, can be paid uh, an amount. We did this at the October Roadshow. Uh, a spouse could be paid uh, more than the age base limit um, and effectively, uh, even if it was through a trust, um, that spouse could be paid that. Um, and uh, effectively would not breach part 4A. So if we run on that, it's a really um, great uh, way of running down things. Um, so, uh, so I've got, uh, will the performance of these be included in CBUS returns for the top 10 super fund list? Actually, that's a good point, really good one. Again, it's all swings and roundabouts. There's no transparency for a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, actually, if uh, John Stitt, thank you, if CBUS was an estimate, if would have breached the sole purpose test that CBUS invests in new building construction employee. I, I, I've always argued that, John, and, and I've always argued, how is it possible? A couple of things there, just on that one. How is it possible um, that a CBUS member, sorry, if I go and work for CBUS, I have to be in the CBUS fund, and the CBUS fund then goes and... Uh, does its property developments. So all my stuff is all tied up. It's very Enronish. Do you know what I mean? If a few of those property developments fail, then I'm basically pretty well uh, stuffed. But more importantly, I can then go to ME Bank um, and get a discounted loan. And again, if we try to do that in SMSF, remember the related party loan rules, PCG 2016-5, again, the commissioner would hit us. And did you all see Australian Super that if you rolled over or started a new account, you got something like 20,000 Qantas points? Surely that has to be breach of the sole purpose test. But again, it's rules for one and rules for another. Um, each of the strategies I'm going to go through fully documented and they're all available on the Lightyear Docs platform. Um, you can go into our support centre. There's heaps of video to show you ins and outs of how to do it. Um, as I said, all our documents are signed up by Abbott Morley and Advisors. Um, so we have had a few accountants who don't want to do SOAs, um, but they're also concerned about dealing with SMSF. So effectively, we can work with you to give letters of advice uh, through the both process. You can do the documentation, we can then do the letter of advice. But that's up to you. So we're pretty, um, we're pretty open and transparent there. Okay, bing, 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 let's start in and get going. So, super access for those under 55 or age under 60. When we have a look at that, um, obviously it's the holy grail. How can we do super access? So, first off, concessional cat, uh, catch ups. When we have a look at that, that's not access. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on. Uh, but concessional cat, catch ups are good, early stages of super. Non concessional caps, we all know that if you don't use it, basically you lose it. Once you hit your $500,000 super balance, the $25,000 you've got in the year, if you don't use it, it's lost. You can't go back. So I love the concessional cap catch-up. They should do an NCC uh, uh, catch-up as well, uh, but I can't imagine they will do that. Um, but look, who knows? Um, so anyway, great strategy for this group is that when we're going down the track, and, and when I start talking about this, uh, when I'm doing face-to-face -face sessions, uh, with clients of advisors and our group, like with Sebastian Mazza's group. It's quite funny because when you're under 55, you've got this concern that I put my money in super, I can't access it. Again, the preservation rule is going to make changes, so on and so forth. If you're over age 60, 65, if they make changes, who cares? You just pull it all out, you can go put it into a discretionary trust. Um, but if you're under age 60, 
you look, let's face it, for 40 year olds, 45, it's a bit of an issue. So here's what I would do. If a client's got spare cash, um, then what I would be doing is uh, effectively um, using that. If they've got the ability to put in $100,000 of NCC, they've got an award, they've got spare cash or whatever, um, even if they've got concessional contributions they can put in, what I would be doing is using that amount of money as equity. So that's an equity deposit by the uh, superannuation fund to then go and buy uh, shares or units. So for example, if I've got $100,000 and I'm putting in, some of it's concessional, 25, 25 is non-concessional, then what I would do is I would treat the $50,000 as the equity component, which now means under commissioners uh, ruling PCG 2016, slash five, I can do a related party loan. So the $100,000 I put in, I get 25 is concessional, 50, uh, sorry, 25 is non-concessional, the other 50 is a loan that I've put in there. Now, obviously I've got my interest rates um, on that one, which is I think about 7.8%, I think. Or, um, again, if you go in, we've actually uh, done a, a strategy automation over this whole uh, strategy. If we then go and put that in, it means that the client can pull that $50,000 out whenever they want. But of course, any growth on that would now be stuck inside the fund. And it's a pretty good deal because what you're doing is you're effectively creating an instalment warrant um, over um, a set of shares, um, still having a related party loan, which throw up a lot more franking credits, which can then be used to offset against, obviously, the contribution. So you can go through this process uh, year by year. So effectively, what we're doing is building up a really good imputation trap uh, that is going to uh, stream out amounts um, effectively uh, into our SMSF for contributions tax liability. So it's a really good strategy. Alternatively, um, you can use it um, over uh, property. Now, the beauty about property, we can go up to 70%, but if we can get commercial lending, then we can actually go up to 80%. I know there's, um, there's, there's quite a few uh, products out there which allow you to go up to 80%. So we could put in um, 25 of uh, super and then we could do a related party loan over say $75,000. Uh, again, that would then um, uh, be a good, uh, potentially, who knows, maybe to put a deposit uh, on a property. Anyway, there's a whole lot of uh, stuff around there. The main thing about that is the client is getting inside the fund, inside a concessionary tax vehicle, but they've also got access to their superannuation fund. Again, have a look on our support centre. I've done quite a uh, large amount of uh, work on that in terms of, um, in, in terms of, uh, sorry, videos. So have a look at that. Um, Paul, you're going to get a copy of the slides and also you will get a recording of this afterwards. Because always I find it the same thing. It's always good to jig my mind about what I'm going through. Particularly if you're going through the recording, you have a look. Um, then, and, and also, of course, if you want to test me, go for it. So have a look at the Commission's guideline, all of that sort of stuff. So remember, you've got a related party loan at call for family use. So it's a great strategy. And again, you don't need to effectively um, have the individual. It could be a family trust doing it or it could be a bucket company effectively doing it there for us. Uh, so uh, when we have a look at um, uh, when we have a look at that, let's go through to the next slide. So that's strategy number one. Uh, strategy number two, I call it tax grouping. Uh, the concessional caps are a joke, but um, exceeding them is not. So that's a bit of a, a nice little negative. I don't mind exceeding them. So let's just uh, flip this through. If you want, I've got, uh, again, I've worked through this case study. Let me let me just go through just for a couple of seconds here, just so um, if you don't mind, um, I'll just go into a light year docs. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time there for you uh, because I've got to get back to the strategies. Um, if I just go into light year docs, I just want to show you here um, all of the strategies I'm looking at today are all covered in um, our support centre up here. Um, so we've got a good um, uh, uh, lending uh, video coming up um, and uh, have a look at that. Uh, support centre, go into the support centre. There's a whole lot of uh, downloadable stuff. It's all free to you guys. Strategy info and advice toolkits. Uh, for those of you doing investment strategies, um, have a look at um, our trustee questionnaire, which you can send out to the trustee, and also a letter, a recommendation letter, post the ATO blitz. If you want to upgrade your deeds, SMSF will client fact find. There's a whole lot of stuff there. 
What I really want to do though is I wanted to take you to the uh, webinar and training videos. Um, the main one there you can see strategy webinars. Last one I did SMSF Wills. Tomorrow I'm doing leading member discretionary trust and also showing you how to upgrade discretionary trust with our resettlement. Um, but if I go down and have a look at that, look, there's a whole lot of um, stuff there. Um, if I wanted to look at that, LYD advisor build instalment warrants, that's the strategy I'm looking at there at the moment. Um, if you don't know what document or what strategies you really want to use at any point in time, then feel free to jump on a line um, and either give me a call and just say, look, I'm doing this, what documentation should I use? Anyway, um, there's, there's quite a lot of this. Um, this is available there. We've got the Smith Discretionary Trust. Uh, with, so we're at, this is where we're starting to build the SMSF and the trust together. So we've got leading member Dr. Matthew Smith, age 40. He distributes to his dad, John, age 64, and Sally, age 59. If he wanted to, he could employ them, uh, provided, of course, they did a work, bit of work, but it doesn't matter now. So we've got John, age 64, John, uh, Sally, age 59. So what we're going to do, John and Sally have an SMSF of $900,000 each, so they've still got plenty of capacity uh, to make concessional and non-concessional contributions, and they're living on John's ABP income uh, and lump sums from Sally, because obviously she's, uh, she's only 59, not yet tax-free, but she can take out, I'm not sure what the, what the amount is there, about $190,000 or $200,000 tax-free. So it's all pretty tickety-boo uh, there. Now, um, when they distribute to uh, Dad, John, age 60, I'll just fix up this uh, slide if you don't mind. I want to make sure that you guys have it. Uh, let's look at distributing uh, seventy thousand dollars. In fact, I'll go. I'll get a bit gutsy. Seventy-five thousand dollars. So we're going to distribute seventy-five thousand dollars each um, to uh, John and also Sally. I'll just save that. Um, I'll bang it up there again on the slide. Now, what do we do there is uh, John and Sally don't pay tax, uh, but we've got Matthew and wife Beth, and he's got a couple of young kids, William and Ben. Um, essentially, obviously, they're at the, the top marginal rate in terms of minors. So if they've only got Matthew and, and Beth are receiving the income, it's a pretty tight squeeze. When I mean, they can put it into John and, and Sally, which isn't a bad thing, but I just want to go through a couple of ideas. Generally, they put it in a bucket company, but again, with bucket companies, over time, you know, you've got the cash in there, usually use them for div 7As and all that sort of stuff, but it's okay. What I would suggest though, is we're gonna put it into, uh, uh, John's gonna get $75,000, and he's gonna contribute into super. Sally's gonna do exactly the same. So what I wanna do is just play it out for you. So um, John contributes $75,000 into super. What happens there is um, it's all concessional contributions. So for John, there's still no accessible income. Uh, when he lodges his return, still no accessible income. So he's got no accessible income from the super fund, no accessible income from the distribution uh, because obviously it comes in and it's offset by the tax deductible um, distribution. Now, what happens there is it goes into the superannuation fund uh, John's already uh, hasn't received a pension there, so it actually gets all accumulated. So his balance would go up to nine hundred and seventy-five thousand. I hope, I hope I'm not losing any of you. Again, I've done a pretty long case study on that. Uh, feel free to come and get that. So of this seventy-five thousand, we know that twenty-five thousand dollars is part of the cap. Fifty thousand dollars is excess. So the way the system works is that um, again, if we have a look at the um, excess contributions tax, so it's not caps anymore excess contributions tax, it's added back to John's accessible income. So he lodges his return um, along with a super fund return, which will say that, hold on, we've received uh, $50,000 of excess concessional uh, on behalf of John, or letting the commission know how much concessional. What will happen there is, uh, from there is the commission will come back and tell John that he is $50,000 in excess, which will then be added back to his accessible income. So we work out the tax payable on $50,000. Uh, now, John's got no other accessible income, so obviously he's got his tax-free threshold, he's got his low income tax offset and the low to medium income tax offset. So we work out that, but the important thing is that $50,000 add back gets a 15% tax offset. So on $50,000, he gets $7,500 tax offset. So I've done the numbers, and in fact, when we have a look at it, the tax payable on $50,000, taking into account the offsets and the tax-free threshold, 
is actually less than the tax offset he gets for that $50,000 um, of uh, excess concessional. So by making $75,000, John will not pay any tax. And if Sally does the same, she will also not pay any tax. So what we're using is our parents to obviously group our taxes. It's now in the SMSF. Of course, what we'd make sure is that when we do an SMSF will for John, that $50,000 or the $75,000, what we would do is do a specific bequest back to Matthew uh, in the event that they die. So there's a compensatory mechanism for the distribution coming in from the family trust. So um, John and Sally don't pay tax. So is there a better way? Absolutely. So have a think about that. Uh, number three, family super. So we've got John and Sally, but in there, but it's terminal. So for example, if John, John suddenly gets Alzheimer's and Sally's running a phone, it's going to be a disaster. And you know that. Because I've seen that happen with my mum. Um, just anyway, I'm not going to... It's family. You know what family's like. Anyway, so uh, when we have a look at that, we want to bring in the next generation. So I, I bring in Matthew and Beth at this stage. Um, in the past, I haven't brought in in-laws, but if you're using a uh, SMSF, you find, uh, particularly if you're using a leading member SMSF, uh, where John has the, John and potentially Sally has the complete power to hire and fire a trustee and hire and fire members. Uh, Beth can come in, but if she gets into a separation with Matthew or divorce, she gets flicked within like 60 days. She just gets a notice, Beth, you're out, that's it, you're gone. But William and Ben would obviously stay in there. Um, but, you know, we've got to wait for the six-member rule to get those two in there. But absolutely right, because remember, um, if I go back to this earlier slide, uh, which is important, um, we, we actually made contributions on behalf of John and Sally. Um, now, with that one, uh, we've got to do our numbers, of course. Uh, but if we've had a really good year because, you know, John, um, so Matthew is a doctor, he's got a lot of income coming through his trust. Um, if Ben and William um, actually work for him in one way, shape or form, as long as they work, um, they can get, uh, they can pay out superannuation contributions or they can get a tax deduction for superannuation contributions. So, you know, you don't, don't want to miss out on that one. And it's the same sort of thing, you know, you have all your tax offsets, so on and so forth. You go to excess if you want. But again, we've got to watch those preservation rules. These guys are too young to really you know, load up quite consistently. Uh, what I would do is, if I had a family SMSF, create separate investment strategies for the younger members versus the older members. Uh, we do have that capacity. Um, there's a separate member-directed uh, SMSF investment strategies on our site. Uh, so what we'd do is we'd wrap up Matthew and Beth to start off with. They would have a separate investment strategy, which I'll look at it shortly versus um, uh, John and Sally, who would have their own um, investment strategy. Obviously, with John, we're going to put him into an ABP pretty quickly. And I, as soon as Sally turns 60, uh, I'd be putting her into an, uh, an A. In fact, I can put a Sally into an ABP straight away now because she's sort of got she's retired. So I'd, 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 I'd rip out all my tax-free super that I've done uh, as a lump sum, but then I'd put her into a uh, ABP once we've made those contributions or those contributions resulting from the distribution of the family trust. So I keep them separate. Um, what I want to do there is um, I would then lend from the bucket company. Remember, we've got that bucket company that's sitting in the family trust. I would then lend to the bucket company under um, the commissioner's guideline, PCG 2016-5. Um, again, that's, that's fully automated for you under the Lightyear Doc system, under our strategy automation. Um, either to, you can do it for shares, uh, you know, basically build new rooms for his doctor. He can build, um, you know, business real property for his existing doctor's build business, extend build new um, rooms to the doctor, flip houses, go and buy houses and flip them. So go in and reno. And remember, if we reno, we can't, um, we can borrow to repair. We can't borrow to reno. But as long as we don't change the style of the, the house, we can use cash out of the fund to flip those houses or effectively go and buy a hobby farm if they wanted to do that all through the fund. So these are all the opportunities, but if we do an LRBA, um, what will happen if we've got a, a group or a pooled investment strategy that goes across the whole fund, then some of the debt on that LRBA is actually going to bleed up to John and Sally and into their T-bar, which doesn't make sense because we're actually reducing the capacity to make contributions slash distribution distributions from the trust slash contributions in the future. But if we segregate, then that's the way to go. 
Plus, uh, what I would do is John and Sally are now getting uh, this uh, increasing uh, contributions coming into the fund. Um, I'd probably look at John and Sally making a family allowance um, agreement. Um, and again, uh, to Matthew's family, which would be Matthew, Beth, um, and also Ben and William. And of course, that could be used to pay for school fees, so on and so forth. Uh, the, the go there is that uh, in the event of the death of either John or Sally, uh, we may be able to argue that um, those family members are financially dependent um, upon John and Sally. And as a consequence of that, um, if they are financially dependent, uh, we'd have a position uh, that they, uh, obviously, the, any death benefits, the taxable component, um, essentially will uh, not be subject to that 17% tax. Now, I've got Liam here. Doesn't the 15% contributions tax offset the 15% pension rebate to the 50? Uh, yeah, so um, if we have a look at really good question, Liam, one of the keys there is that uh, with the 15% tax offset, so if I can go back to this one, Liam, um, and let's just play around. In fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave it, and yeah, no, I'll go back here. So if I go back here, uh, one of the issues, and you remember, in fact, it probably goes back here. One of the issues that we are faced um, with all of this is that when we do make a concessional contribution, um, effectively, we are up for, uh, obviously, contributions tax. Now, by having a, uh, a, a related party loan, it means we can buy $100,000 of stock um, but effectively, we're only putting in $50,000 of equity being, remember, the 25 concessional, 25 non-concessional. Now, $100,000 that we just bought ANZ stock, we're going to be up for, what, about $4,500 of uh, effectively, uh, probably only about $4,500 of cash dividend with the $3,000 imputation credit or thereabouts. Um, so when we have a look at that $3,000 imputation credit, um, that effectively... Uh, would allow me to shelter um, some, I'll just get my week calculator out here. Liam, you're a lot smarter than me. I'm sure you could probably do it a lot quicker. Uh, but if I have a look at my week calculator, um, that if I've got $3,000 of imputation credits and divide it by 0.15, um, again, that gives me $20,000 of shelter. Now, that's great for this system, remember, because they're only putting in 25. And remember, this is an ongoing, because each year we do that, we're going to keep on doing that process. Here, uh, with our family superannuation, then, um, oh, sorry, for the, the tax grouping, what we do need to know is that we are up for, when we put those concessional contributions and the excess, the whole $75,000 is accessible income to that uh, family superannuation fund. Now, as a consequence of that, um, we are looking for a tax offsets in the fund. We talked about imputation credits. Remember, we're wrapping it up in an instalment warrant, so the underlying deductions um, are also will start to reduce that seventy-five thousand dollars if we're borrowing, you know, fifty thousand dollars or forty-five thousand dollars, probably at a rate of seven percent. We're looking at maybe three thousand dollars. Not a huge amount, but the offsets will go against that. The other one coming up to thirty June will be a big one. Is your early stage innovation companies? When you get a twenty, um, when you get a uh, effectively a twenty thousand, sorry, a twenty percent tax offset. Again, we can do an LRBA over those as well. So your question, uh, Liam, is absolutely uh, right. The fifteen percent offset that we're getting to reduce those, um, we still, if we're putting fifteen percent in and fifteen percent out. It's really, there's not much of an arbitrage, but if we can reduce our contributions tax liability in through ESIC uh, inside the fund, uh, which is not refundable, then effectively we're in a good position. But do your spreadsheets. I'm working with um, uh, I'm uh, working with the guys at Change GPS and Tim Munro to build some calculators for this. So expect that coming out uh, very shortly. The 1322C company, uh, which is a, a unit trust that is a related trust. Um, effectively, um, that vehicle is a joint venture vehicle between an SMSF and a related party. It could be a member, uh, could be their parents, discretionary trust or bucket company. So in there, we could put investment property, rural property, um, commercial property, you can even put in artwork if you want to keep away from that. So effectively, we can put in anything in there. The thing is we can't put in, we can't have any gearing inside that 1322C trust or company. 
um, and it can't hold shares or units. It can only hold, um, effectively, as I said, property. Now, the thing about it, it's actually specifically excluded from the in-house asset rules under Section 711J. And again, you're going to find, if you go to our support centre, I've got a whole hour webinar on that if you're really interested um, in that. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you like the tip of the iceberg, but knowing that not only the documentation to 1322C Trust and Companies is, uh, is on the Lightyear Docs site, and all our docs are no more than $99. Investment strategies are $49. In fact, we've got a couple that are free. So when we have a look at that, um, uh, you can build that and know that you've got the evidentiary requirements there. Now, the thing about it is, um, if we've got a JV, which I look at between a bucket company or the parents, uh, what can happen though is these, uh, th while it's a 1322C uh, company or trust, is actually excluded from um, the Section 66 rules, which are that a related party uh, can't transfer an asset, being, for example, a, a unit or a, a share into our superannuation fund. So again, we could, if we wanted to, we could do a, a LIBA over those units going in provided, of course, we can show that there's a commerciality um, around that process. So we can contribute, sell, or LRBA. So it means we start off, if the, the super fund hasn't got enough equity in it um, to, for example, acquire the property, doesn't want to go through an LRBA, it can actually go through the process with a family trust. The family trust does the borrowing to acquire the units um, inside, the, um, inside that uh, trust. Um, obviously, the distributions come out, uh, the family trust would then get a deduction for it or it could be a bucket company. And then once the deductions are removed or we get a tax positive, we can then flip those units or the shares over into our SMSF and whatever the valuation is there is a contribution, a sale or an LRBA. So again, I, I see a lot of people utilising that strategy. It's one I really love doing because, again, it shows the symbiosis between the discretionary trust and also the SMSF. Now, the final one is the protected mode. This is one that we came out with in December. We've had more than uh, 30 people build a moat. So what the moat does is actually, um, again, we talk about the Family Provisions Act. This is a complete um, succession and estate planning package. We've got uh, a more extensive one of this, which deals with the uh, family trust and fixing up a, a family trust for a remote purpose. I haven't got time to go into it in detail, but go and have a look at I, I showed you that in the, the support centre if you want to do that. Um, when we have a look at that, uh, what we can do is, this is, um, this is straight out of our um, site, uh, but effectively we can do an enduring power of attorney for our client. And what I'd be doing is for each of our clients, I'm having one of these moats quite separately. So you'll be able to do the enduring power of attorney for the client, um, and then you can uh, have a look at your superannuation fund. Uh, we can uh, upgrade it to a, uh, we can either set up a, um, a new SMSF if you haven't done it, um, or you can upgrade um, an existing SMSF to either a leading member or a special purpose corporate trustee. My preference is leading member. If you're not getting my daily emails, have a look at that. Um, and I'll talk about the, um, uh, the accreditation very shortly. Um, upgrade the SMSF trustee, so we can do both corporate trustee and the, the trustee. We can just do the ordinary, or you can actually do establishment. Uh, on top of that, we can do a, um, a SMSF will, which is just a set of binding death benefits, declarations and nominations. Uh, have a look again at my uh, succession on that. And then you can actually do a will with the uh, attached uh, testamentary trust or inbuilt testamentary trust. And again, I've got that... Um, uh, I've got that process on there if you want to go into detail. So as an accountant or financial planner or what we call now our new succession and estate planning advisors, do you like that one? Uh, succession and estate planning advisors, um, you'll be able to basically do all of those. Um, for a couple of things where you do need legal sign off such as testamentary trust, potentially enduring power of attorney, you'll be able to link in with Abbott Morley um, and effectively go through that process and it's only going to be like $500. So that's a, that's a good way to get the, the legal sign off. But if you did that for the client, and you're not going to, honestly, you'll find when you go through, you can see up here on the left, the common party. So if we had a look at the common party in terms of the, the Smith family, we'd have as a common party, John Smith, Sally Smith, Matthew Smith, Beth Smith, 
uh, Ben Smith, William Smith, we'd work out what the bucket company is, put that in there. We put in your details because obviously as the advisor account, we're going to build in uh, legally, contractually into the SMSF will um, how much you're going to get paid in the event that the client dies and you're going to look after the SMSF estate. Um, you put obviously the trustee of the SMSF and the SMSF in. So that means when you go through and build these, um, you simply need to tick and flick and you'll find that it can be done extremely quickly. So it should take you no more than 15 to 30 minutes actually to to build all of these. We've had a number of advisors do it for themselves. In fact, we've had a couple of absolutely brilliant clients have actually just done it for themselves. So people have been following me and they've done uh, brilliant uh, jobs at it. So uh, Ian, um, you know, hats off to you, Ian Hall. You've done a brilliant job and a couple of you guys have been absolutely um, outstanding in terms of doing this. But the whole thing about this is um, protecting our assets. When we come down to the SMSF will, uh, what we're doing is um, we're trying to keep everything either paid out directly to our adult children um, or alternatively going out to an SMSF death benefits trust. Uh, we can do our last will and testament in the comprehensive estate planning package, which is the mo. but effectively we're protecting everything there. But again, I can only just show you that to me is the, the biggest game plan. I mean, when you have a look at that, there's uh, going to be about 15 documents, goes for 160 pages. Um, if you went to a legal firm, you're paying at least 15 or 20 grand on that one. So, again, that's a, a new, new stuff that you can start to offer the clients. I know that you outsource a lot to lawyers, but what I'm saying is that bring in house, we can uh, sign it off for you, as I said, for $500 per person, um, and then you're off and running. The mode itself, for all that documentation, you have a look at normally if you're looking at it from us, it's our enduring power attorney is $99, $99.99. Um, 99 99 as well. It's all combined, very effective and efficient. It's $450, I think, or $440, which is really the cost of most uh, legal firms just to do an SMSFD or trustee upgrade. So it's certainly great value. For those of you, you can see up here the LY Strategist, which is a monthly payment, including CPD and everything, of $795 a month, or if you want to do licensing, which is I think 6950 lump sum for a whole year, and you get unlimited documents, unlimited CPD and everything. So it's a, a great solution. But we've just got an administrator who's got 2,000 funds has just signed up uh, for 795 per month. So, you know, they're going to uh, absolutely kill it. Anyway, um, some important stuff I just want to wind up here. Um, tomorrow we're doing discretionary trust upgrades, leading member discretionary trust. Um, if you're not involved there, make sure you go on and, and register for each of our webinars. Um, you can do that lot here, Docs. Um, if you're on our CPD platform, either LY Strategist um, or alternatively um, through ILS, um, uh, your ILS Strategist, um, then what you'll do is we've got a whole system. Go on and have a look at uh, I Love uh, SMSF and have a look at events. You'll see there's a whole range of uh, events that give CPD over the next 30, um, up, up to 30 June. Make sure you get your CPD. Soon to come with the protector. Basically what that does is rip out equity from existing investment properties, existing uh, personal property, um, shares, anything outside of a family trust and SMSF and puts it into an existing trust or into a new leading member discretionary trust um, and doesn't create any uh, CGT or stamp duty processes. So that at the end of the day, the old point is there is that we end up with an estate that has nothing in it. So the SMSF will is going to, sorry, the SMSF will, the will and testamentary trust are going to be very light on. Um, and effectively, it means we're safe from a family protection. That's what we want to do, make sure we're protecting our families. Um, I've got a two day and it's accredited succession estate planning course. Um, if you haven't read my stuff, uh, we will be setting up an association around this. Um, so you'll get fully uh, credited for that. For those of you SMSF advisor account, it just gives you something else to put up on the wall, but it enables you to do the moat, the extensive moat, and also the protector, which to me is, remember that's that $3 trillion, which is passing. It's only $595. It's at the um, Novotel. I'll be sending your details through. You can go and search on uh, Eventbrite uh, for I Love SMSF events, um, but it'll also be up on the I Love SMSF site. It's got 11 CPD hours. Uh, I think we've got a special rate for the Novotel of $149 per night, um, 180 if it's a, a twin room, and uh, flights up at that time. Uh, if you're from Melbourne, I think I did a look, it's 
getting something like about $300 return. So again, worthwhile doing that. I mean, for effectively probably just over $1,000, you're going to have 11 CPD hours, you're going to be accredited, and you're going to be spending a couple of days with me. We're going to go through all this. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. Um, look, a final one, if you're not part of the Lightyear platform, look, there's so many new earning strategies coming out. This is, you know, if you're part of the platform, you get all this. As I said, they're all $450. All our normal documents, just one of are $99. Some are investment strategies, are only $49. Don't pay too much. But more importantly, from our perspective, um, you know, come on as a, a licensee, um, which you can do on a year-by-year -year basis. Just pay an upfront payment of $6,950. Um, or alternatively, if you want to get uh, with CPD and unlimited documents, it's 795. Um, or if you're just an accountant or administrator, you just want the documents, unlimited documents, it's uh, $595 per month. But you can drop in and out. Uh, you know, if, for example, we've had a couple that um, uh, didn't take up January because obviously it's a quiet month and we don't mind that. We're flexible and don't sign you up to any long-term contracts. But anyway, um, look, that's enough from me. Uh, contact me at any point in time, Grant I'm a, I've got a great position in the world. I'm just doing strategies after strategies. We're in a very exciting time. We really want to make sure that 2020 is absolutely awesome for us. As I said, this succession of state planning to me is the, is the new way because it's not compliance. It's not, it's not just tax. It's actually protecting a family's wealth, which really hits the hot button for a lot of our clients. We'll be sending you out this recording with uh, slides and a whole lot of other stuff as well. And, um, and I've got their anonymous attendee, LRB is a set of a single pile of less not money. Could this type of structure be used to purchase some of the shares in the medical practice mentioned in the case study? Yeah, you can if it's a, if, yeah, probably not a medical practice um, because the medical practice where you've got their, um, the exemption under 1322C is excluded where you run a, a company. But look, um, what I, what I, you could if it's less than 5%, absolutely. So there's no drama about that. And you could do an LIBA. So um, please feel free. Um, I, I only exist for strategies and you know that. And I love doing strategies and I love doing case studies all the time. I get about five or 10 a day where I help. Just if you've got those sort of issues, you've got these brainwaves, we, you know, come to me and more than happy to take your call. Grind I love smsf.com, send me an email. We can work on stuff together. And I'm hearing the more the more I learn from you guys, the better off it is, particularly as we go down this succession of state planning. Anyway, it's Grant Abbott um, signing off uh, for this session. And look, guys, uh, we've got a great session and love working with you. Thanks for that.